Hello, welcome back to Hobby News Daily and another edition of Speaking with Danny. Um, I'm joined by Brandon Verzel today, and did I finally get that right? You got it. That was perfect. All right. I, I, you know, I've been working in the mirror all afternoon, and I just wanted to make sure. I said I'm going to screw up a lot of things today, but I, I at least deserve to get your name right. Um, you are the producer of The Card Life. I right? am. Which I'm, I'm lucky to be the producer of The Card Life. Yeah, and I reached out to you because I love watching, and um, you are the first, the first of the first uh, shows uh, in this genre of the hobby um, on TV, and that's just super cool. And 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 who doesn't want to talk about that? So, um, <laughs> other than busting your chops for being a Nebraska fan, um, and I'm a Maryland fan, and a little Big Ten rivalry um, of which I lose every argument in that debate. But we, you know. <laughs> Uh, glad to have you on. Welcome, uh, <laughs> and thanks for being here. Great to be here, Danny. I'm super excited about it and glad to chat with you. All right. So I guess my first question is, is uh, you are the owner of V2 Content Studios, and, and part of that is making shows and, and producing content. Um, and I, and, and, and I, if I have this correctly, you have produced over 1,500 shows? Yeah, for a, okay. for a long time. <laughs> So, what is your background that, that got that get, that got up to that number? So, when I was in when when I was in college at University of Nebraska, I worked for Husker Vision, which is like the department within the athletic department that produces all of the coaches' shows, what goes on on the big screens during timeouts and features, all that kind of stuff. So, as a student, I was able to do some really cool things. You know, when I was a sophomore, junior, senior, I was a co-producer of Tom Osborne's show in the '90s. During, while I was still a student at Nebraska. So that's where it started, was producing shows for the Huskers at Nebraska. I worked in Major League Baseball for the Royals and the Rays and the Mariners, and we didn't really have shows. My concentration for those teams was just producing the in-stadium entertainment. So all of the music and the highlight videos and, sure. and the stuff that goes on during the game, the live production of the game. Then when I went back to college athletics at Texas A&M Athletics, again, we were back into doing 150, 175 TV shows a year, you know, a couple a week, three, three a week of different coaches shows and things like that. When I left that realm and moved back to Nebraska where I grew up and we started, my wife and I started V2 Content, she has the same background I do. She's a co-producer of, of The Card Life. And um, we started producing shows again. So we come up with an idea, we produce a show, and then we reach out to broadcasters and say, would you be interested in airing this show? And uh, the main one that started after we started our company again was a show called Power of Sports. And we'd go to a different city each month and tell stories about ways that sports were being used in that community to do good. So we talked to the local teams about community initiatives they had. We'd find a nonprofit that would use sports to accomplish their mission. And we just turned it into a, just a feel good show that was positive about sports. And that same broadcasting networks, at the time it was Fox Sports, it's now become Valley Sports. They'd aired our shows for, for several years. And I had this idea of doing a, a TV show about cards and then that's where it transitioned into us being able to do a, a sports card show as well. So that number encompasses my career when I worked for sports teams and then afterwards as well. And it, 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 the, the great thing about it is in most ways we have complete independent control. Like we come up with what we want to talk about, what we think is interesting, where we want to go every month. There isn't someone telling us do this, do that, include this or include that. And that's what we enjoy more than anything else. It's just that autonomy to be creative, never have. We got to have these elements in every single show. And we have sponsorship stuff because that's how we fund the show. But other than that, it's just go somewhere and tell cool stories about the hobby. I guess, where did the actual idea for the show come from? Did Was there, was there, a, was it a pandemic moment? Was, was it a... Uh you know, a, a single moment or, or was it a, a, an idea that evolved? Like you said, you're, you're always having ideas that turn into shows. Did, did it kind of evolve to the final product? Yeah, I'd always thought it was unusual. So I'd say the idea was probably 2015, 2016. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I got back into the hobby around 2009. I kind of did the same thing, collected growing up, didn't, you know, college, early years of career, which I don't know why I didn't when I was, well, I do know because I was working at Major League Baseball, you work 
16 hour days, the last thing you want to do is go home and look at players again after you've been around them all day. You're sick of them by that point. So that's I why I didn't to, do it. At I, that used to work for the, I used to work for the Braves and for oh, the yeah. Oil, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, no, no. All you want to do is hit the bar, have a drink and go home and go to bed. Yeah. I mean, I was in Seattle yeah. when Ichiro's there. I PC Ichiro now. And I'm like, what was I thinking? I could have got his autograph on a million of his rookie mm -hmm. cards working for the team. And it was just never even a thought, but got back into the hobby around that 2008, 2009, after we'd come back and started a, our own company. And I'd always thought that all these networks that we were doing TV shows on, nobody ever talks about sports cards. There's never been a show about it. There's been collectible shows. There's been shows online are about cards, but I think collectibles and cards, but something that so many people have like a deep childhood connection to, it just never was talked about. I mean, not even, even today, there might be small segments and stuff, but it's just not into the main fabric of mainstream sports media. So I thought that it, something was there, but I also knew that if I approached those TV broadcasters, they'd think I was nuts for doing a show about, you know, who collects baseball cards? That's the, the nerdy guys at the stores that look like, you know, uh, antique shops. Yep. And uh, so the pandemic was kind of that tipping point where I knew I could at least approach those people because they were reading articles in the Wall Street Journal and seeing ESPN stories and stuff just because of what was happening with the hobby and the pandemic. So I emailed those broadcasters, told them my idea at that point. This was uh, early 2020. They replied, I mean, within five minutes and said, oh, my gosh, this is huge right now. Yes, let's do it. I DM'd Matt Strom, who at the time was pitching for the Padres on Twitter, said, you want to host a sports card show? Because I knew he was a collector. He was already posting YouTube videos of his breaks. He said, let's do it. And then three months later, we were filming in Arizona, and we've been doing it for every year since. Maybe this is naive on my part, being an East Coast guy, but Matt's very good on camera. Um, and and you're, it's either... You're, you're doing a tremendous job on your end, or he's doing a tremendous job on his end. Um, so I'm going to ask this delicately. Uh, when, when you first met Matt, was it seeing him on social media that gave you a comfort level? I mean, I, I got to admit, I thought it would be a really tough kind of spot to cast for or person to find because they, they, they have to have – the hobby will, will catch the fake. <laughs> yeah. The thing that I, and I was worried about the same thing, because working with athletes my whole career, I knew there were people that were dynamic in some settings, then you put them in front of a camera and big eyes and, you know, can't get a sentence out. I mean, I've filmed with players before where if I had to film three sentences, I was breaking it up into three parts and three sentences, editing it together to make them look good, but they could never run that together. So going to Arizona, other than his agent saying the great thing about Matt and cards is he's like a kid, like, that's his thing. Like he just lights up when you talk about cards and when he's talking about cards. And so the, my, his agent, Alan said, if you can get that him in that environment, that's the way hopefully he'll be if he's comfortable with you. So that was my goal going down to Arizona, meeting him for the first time. Literally we, we met, shook hands, said, Hey, this is great. We're doing this. And we started shooting 15 minutes later at a card shop. And uh, that was the great thing is that he just talks. He's just like a kid and he's interested he knows things about the hobby, but he's inquisitive about things. He's not afraid to, if somebody says something, to question it or say, well, why isn't it this way, uh, wh which has just been great. And I'd, I'd say the other thing, and I've learned this throughout my career working with athletes, is it's just me on these shoots. Like, I'm the one that films. I'm the one who edits. I'm the one who writes. It's just me and Matt in a room most of the time unless we have a guest. And so that allows, I think, those athletes to feel more comfortable than when there's two camera or three camera people and an audio guy and a producer and somebody checking the script. Like we're just there kind of working through what we need and how we need to do it. And so it's natural. It's naturally him. And I think he, he feels comfortable that it's just like us hanging out and talking about cards. I just happened to have a camera on my shoulder at the time. Um, at the time of recording, uh, you are mid season three. Um, you, you have not fired Matt yet. Um, he's, he's, he's still there. Um, he's in the middle of a two-year contract with the Phillies, um, and we're in the offseason right now, so he's heading into year two. How much does your job or the show, by his schedule, what team he's on, I know, you know, or is it, hey, listen, we're working around it. We knew that going in, and, and that's just, you know, part of this show. 
So in season, I, what I do is every single, well, I know whatever team he's played for, we're probably going to do a show or two during the season from his home city. But the, the rest of the time, I just look at the four or five places he's on the road and say, oh, we haven't done a Denver show yet. We haven't done a Chicago show yet. I'm meeting Matt. Usually it's the, I usually let him get in because if they're traveling from somewhere else, they may get in at two or three in the morning. So I, I wait until at least the second day of the homestand when he's getting to a new city. And we usually meet late morning in that city, film for two to three hours is usually what it takes for me to film the stuff I need with Matt. Now I'll go film other stories because he obviously can't spend eight hours in the city going all around because we're shooting on a game day. I he usually gets to the ballpark about one. So I kind of have that late morning, early afternoon window to get him to the ballpark and, and going because he obviously has another job that pays a lot better and is a lot more important. But uh in season and that's what's really fun i mean it's fun looking every month and saying oh let's do tampa this month let's do la let's do new york because everywhere we go there's i mean as you know from what you do there's 30 different cool stories in every city that we go to so we've done shows in some places two or three times and i still have lists of stories that i want to do in those areas so that's the great thing in season off season we matt's flown places during the off season that we wouldn't be able to go during a season we're hoping to do a cooperstown show maybe in January, because they have the big baseball card exhibit there. He's never seen that. And that's that's chalk. That's, that's chalk. <laughs> and he's only four hours away now. You know, Philadelphia is yeah. not that far from Cooper. Before, we were trying to figure out how to get him from San Diego to Cooperstown, and that's logistically a lot harder. So the schedule is tough, I mean, in terms of us being limited, but it's also really, really cool that we get to do that and have him in that environment on, on a game day. And like the sign behind me, these are all the ballpark. Me and my dad are trying to visit all the ballparks. Those are box scores from all the places that we've been to. I get to add stadiums every month with my dad to that list. I'm slowly crossing them off because I get to go to places I may not have been before, which has been, been a whole lot of fun, but yeah, that's the, the great thing about it. And the other thing I'd say about Matt is the fact that he's played for so many different organizations has been great for us. Like people, Knew him when he was a prospect and, and in the Royals. The grid. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the Royals, people saw him come up there, and so they followed him. He goes to San Diego, and that was such a big team and a popular team, so we got a following there. The Red Sox, obviously, are never going to hurt. And then being with the Phillies now with the incredible fan base they have, we have four fan bases that have known him, plus we have the group of people who collect that think it's cool that a player collects, so that – brings another audience in. So I really couldn't have picked a more perfect person. And I think it's better that he hasn't just played for one team throughout his career. We have people kind of from all over that still root for him in San Diego because of the card connection and them kind of connecting to him, even though he is a relief pitcher that isn't like the main guy trumpeted out there every day. Uh, people in San Diego kind of embraced him more because of that sports card side of things. Well, I think it also, it, it brings... There's a cool aspect when he pulls a card and says, oh, good pull, good player. You know, like he knows that some guys are better than him. He's better than some guys. You know, I mean, everybody knows when they play ball, they, they, they all self-rank. But he's so genuine in his appreciation for the other players. Yeah. It comes across like, you know, it's not the value of the card, ever, you know, and he comes yeah. a great player, you know, or he'll tell a story. And I think collectors resonate with that. Yeah. Uh, and it's yeah. amazing. It's amazing when he goes through a pack and you realize how interwoven all those players are that he's like, Oh my gosh, I room with this guy at my first minor league stop. You know, <laughs> this guy hit the first time I ever threw an off speed pitch in pro baseball. He hit a home run off me lefty. to left field. Yeah. I mean, that's the stuff yep. that's just amazing to hear and hear the way their mind works with that stuff. I love it when he gets a autograph card of a pitcher and he's like, no offense. I wouldn't want to pull my own self because I'm a pitcher. Pitcher cards suck and throws it off to the side. You know, it's fun to hear him saying that he's not making fun of the guy. He's just saying everybody wants good hitter cards. And also the fact that he's not afraid to get super excited about getting a trout card or an Otani card, even though he may be facing that guy in seven, seven hours and have to get him out in a eighth inning, seventh inning situation. But he still thinks it's awesome. He's getting this card and celebrates it. And that people aren't like, oh, that's so stupid that a player is excited about getting another player's card. He likes the hobby. That's why he's excited about it. So, yeah, it's been super. There, I, I need to probably go back through some of those breaks that, you know, we're in a room for an hour and a half during some of those, and they turn into a four-minute segment. 
And I try to put the most fun tidbits in there, but there's so much more. Well, we'll just on an aside, I'll walk up to the table and we're talking for five minutes about this player, or this story about this player. That stuff's just really fun to hear from any professional athlete when you get those tidbits. No, it's awesome. To me, it's like reading the back of the baseball card for the, you know, like the, uh, you get that you get it actually in person. So um, I think that's very cool. Uh, how do you choose which stories? I mean, other than you listen, there's the reality of the world. We, we, we you know, so, some stories, you know, are, are part of the production schedule always. But w- when you're choosing stories to, to put in, what makes a, a compelling story for you? I mean, I, I happen to know Bo Thompson. Um, you know, we, 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 we used to do a show together. So when you meet somebody who's trying to collect a million cards, I got to assume you, you say, I, I got to meet whoever this is. Um, and, and, and the, the relief room, um, you know, certain things, you know, as I would just want to see just on the pure curiosity of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then other things are really sentimental. So how do you choose how to balance the, the, the laugh versus the seriousness versus the hobby and then choose those. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really tried to dig in you as, you know, a background in reporting. It's the same thing where, you know, I know I'm going to a city. I'm going to kind of do a general Google search of Philadelphia and sports cards, Philadelphia and football cards, basketball cards. But, you know, the first like 10 to 15 pages are probably going to be the same two or three stories about a sports card robbery. Oh, the pandemic has been great for sports cards. You know, you really have to dig in there before you get something that's interesting or unusual. And I don't want to just tell the same stories that everybody else has told. And so the the best things I find is really digging. And then it's just that balance of, you know, did we do a more sentimental story last month? Maybe we need to do something more funny or fun or interesting and uh and i'm always thinking through the eye too of what i really think is interesting like you said i'll go to these stories i'll film for a couple hours it'll be a three to four minute segment but i'm probably there for an hour afterwards like oh show me some more of your stuff you know you know what's over here in this drawer and tell me a story about this that i'm not even filming just because i'm really really interested in it i love that part of this whole process of just meeting people and, and and finding out and them showing things that They may not even have out there publicly or talk about the story behind why this is so important to them. That's the stuff that I just love doing. I mean, the the Philadelphia show was uh, a a great example of, um, um, I've kind of lost my train of thought of what what I was gonna say. But anyways, that's that's really about the most fun part of the show that, that I really, really enjoy. Which stories, do you remember looking back and saying that 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 worked out Th- that was funny you know that 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 hit that that hit you know i i brought up the relief room i'm sorry that 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 is one of those that i don't know if i'll ever forget that story and, it, you know? and that was another one where it was i think it was buried and somebody had done a new york times article about it like four or five years ago just a little bit about it, but not a whole lot. So it was like the digging into that was was just awesome and how excited he was to share that. Like oh. once I reached out, it was like, oh, this is so great that this is gonna be featured and it's something I can keep from all time is like a accounting of this and a story storyline of this. I, I mean, the thing I probably enjoyed the most was I went down to San Jose and interviewed Terry Smith who created the ProVisions cards in the 1990s, the inserts from FLIR. And I spent almost a half day with him and he's done incredible things with gaming and all kinds of stuff design. He created the San Jose Sharks logo, hit their jerseys. I mean, he's done all kinds of things, but he was so excited that somebody wanted to talk about ProVisions again, you know, 30 years after he had come up with that idea and his whole thing of like, you know, the Donruss Diamond Kings, he's like, they're cool, but that's not what our athletes are now. They're more superheroes. They're not the old time portraits, you know, this is what I think our athletes should be. They should look like they're superheroes and him drawing up a Dwight Gooden, sending it to all the card companies saying, this is what, a what these cards should look like it taking years for somebody to pull it out and say yes to it. And those cards are just so iconic for that era and, and kind of being the first art cards, the first insert chases and things like that. 
And, uh, and he was just brilliant. He's just a, a brilliant mind and, and had a lot of vision in that junk wax era to do something unique and different. So that's one of the ones that, that really stands out to me is just a really, really cool story. Now, the question is, is when I buy my wife uh, um, her next present, which baseball card belt do I buy her? <laughs> How cool is that? That's another one of my stories and one of my favorites. Like, right. like I got so card belts. All I'm doing is I'm on my Facebook and I'm constantly he <laughs> I, Will has a background like in uh, digital marketing. And so okay. I keep seeing card belts on my timeline all the time. I'm like this guy knows what he's doing because he's targeting me right. and I'm seeing this all the time. And when I knew we were I I literally knew I wanted to do a show about card belts and I found a way to make a Colorado show work knowing I wanted to do that story. And I drive out there, Will's got the setup in his garage and he literally is the person who would have a business making card belts. I mean, just the perfect personality, everything. My wife, it's like her favorite feature to watch just because of Will's personality. Oh. And, uh, I, and they're so cool too. I mean, I, I, I loved, I love Will. I love, you know, after we had the feature on the show about card belts, he was seeing incredible traffic of people thinking how cool they were and and buying the belts, which I just think is awesome, just because it was such a cool, innovative idea. It, it, it is pure fun. And I think the hobby likes pure fun sometimes. It is. It is. Um, I mean, it just it, it just is. And, and, yeah, and, and, absolutely. And, um, and that's one of the things I think that really resonates on the show is, yeah. you know, it's OK to talk about baseball bats that are painted really cool, you know, for a younger demographic, a hitter. Um, and the owners happen to like cards also, yeah, yeah. but that was really cool to see the bats on the cards, like that connection. Yeah. You know, I was like, Holy smokes. Well, that's not exactly what I said, but you know, it was like how to see your bat on the card must be such a cool feeling. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that they're like looking through every card to see right. oh, look, this one has our logo more. And then, you know, when they came out just a few see months ago, this one. <laughs> when they came out with Matt's new card and it talks, it references the card life on the back. This is his update card that just oh. came out uh, a month and a half ago. And on the back, it says Matt, who hosts a TV show about baseball cards called the card life. I have been buying every version of this card I can possibly find because I'm like, I'll never be on a baseball card. But the fact that card life is mentioning on it is like the coolest thing in the world to me. So I love, you know, it's just like those Victus guys. Like I found what I want to collect now is right. cards that mention the card life on the back. So it, it, those kind of things are just so much fun to hear. I've had uh, I've had people that I've known in the past when I worked in, in sports reach out to me and say, Oh my God, I collect cards in uh, Aaron Buckles is his name. He's a, he's an animation guy in Ohio and he made the scoreboard animations that were in the background when Ripken broke Gehrig's streak record. And he collects cards of the graphics of his that are behind Ripken and all of the shots on different cards. I mean, how cool is that? How cool is that, that, that somebody searches out those cards and there's constantly reissues of that because of celebrating that moment. And sure. in the background is the dot matrix board that says, you know, the number, the streak, congratulations, Cal, and all that kind of stuff. That I stuff was at the so game. I was at the game. I remember Really? That. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. I remember uh, I remember the graphics. I remember um, exactly what you're talking about. Um, it is such a small world. That's hysterical. He did a great – I mean, that was fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, when I hear stuff like that of people collecting, you know, I've done stories on people in the background of cards. I just ended up finding like three stories of a former Twins Bat Boy that's in the background of a Joe Maurer card. Somebody who's in the back of a Jokic card on courtside and right. did a story on just them appearing on it in that moment when they find out that they're in the background. One of them, it's, he owns a sports card shop and a breaking business in Denver. And he was breaking cards. And that's when he found out his son was on the back of the Jokic card. He's like screaming, hey! Come in here. You're on the back of this new card of Jokic's. <laughs> I mean, that's that that kind of well, stuff. Better just... than the Menendez brothers. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. That's right, exactly yeah. right. There's just so many angles to this that I don't think exists if you're doing a story on collecting stamps, I guess. Or I mean, there's just I think there there's so many layers of stories to tell besides just here's my collection. This is cool. You know, this is how much this is worth. Or I think I could get this for this. There's just so much, I think, to the hobby to be told, and that's what's really cool about it. 
Well, I assume anybody who's watching this, uh, we don't need to sell um, on, 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 on how much we could all dork out over this. Um, I got to tell you, as somebody who grew up going to stadiums with their father, I am so jealous of that scoreboard behind you. I just want to say this whole interview, I've just been staring at that, and I need to figure out – I got to talk to my brother. We got to figure out how to do something for dad. Uh, yeah. Yeah, what's cool is it says the year that we were there, and then it actually has the exact line score. It has the winner, the you know, the winning pitcher, the losing pitcher, all that kind of stuff. So it's good to glance up at and be like, oh, that was my first game, and you know, it was a three to two game and everything else. It's it, it was a really fun fun thing to do. Well, Brandon, thank you for being on. I promised to get you out on time, and you've been overly generous. So thank you very much for coming on. Um, tell everybody uh, the easiest way to watch and find the show. Yeah, so it's pretty much on most of the networks your favorite sports teams are on. It's on 26 networks across the country. You can check our website, thecardlifetv.com, and a full broadcast schedule is there. After 30 days, we place them all on our YouTube channel, which is also the Card Life TV. So if you're not in one of those markets, you still get to see the exact same episode everybody else does. Follow us on social media, the Card Life TV. We post other content on there, as well as the stuff that's on the show. So you can see it no matter where you're at. Brandon, thank you so much. Um, I will see you in the green room and everybody. Thanks for watching. And thanks for uh, another episode of hobby news daily. Take thanks care. Danny. Thank you.